can negotiate. <laughs> okay, anyway, now thanks a lot. No, I'm, I'm glad to be here, thanks, Stefan. Uh, and uh, when I was asked uh, what type of presentation I should uh, provide, uh, when he said, Stefan simply said, uh, do anything, it just has to be exciting. Uh, and okay, so I thought of uh, my work a long time ago on the quantum mechanics of fractal structures, which would be very exciting, but it would be far away from the subject, so I decided to do something else, which was actually inspired. We just come back last week from the Pontifical Academy of Sciences meeting, the General Assembly last week in, in the Vatican in Rome, and uh, this was really a fantastic meeting because we had everything coming together, artificial intelligence, uh, earth observation, uh, the future of cancer therapy, uh, systems analysis of the planetary dynamics and so on, and I, I give you a few glimpses of that related to Indian Earth observation. Uh. So the title is a very strange one, I hope I can explain it to you. The global subject, the basic idea is, has any one of you ever read uh, the famous novel of Stanislav Lem, Solaris? Nobody? Oh yeah. Fortunately, a few people saw the light. Uh, thank you. <laughs> it's a fantastic novel, uh, science fiction, of course, but somehow it's coming true now uh, because something through the internet and many other things, something like a global brain is, is establishing now in a very weird, actually in a very dangerous way maybe, and it's based that we are creating something like a global intelligence, which is again based on the global perception. Uh, we look at the earth every instant, so to speak, we can see what is going on and we are communicating with millions of people instantly, so to speak, and something like a global subject is emerging. And uh, on the same, at the same time, we are actually about to risk the very existence of our civilization with climate change, with many other things. And the question is, who is going to win the race? Uh, global intelligence based on global observation or global destruction based on, you know, uh, we are very smart now already, but we have all the tools in our hands to destroy this planet. And who is going to win in the end? That's the big question. Anyway, so I wrote a book a long time ago, actually starting in 1994, called Earth System Analysis. And when it was published, I was asked by Nature to write one of the Millennium Essays uh, in 1999, just at the turn of the millennium. And it was called Earth System Analysis and the Second Copernican Revolution. And it's a nice paper. You can still find it, open access. So my recommendation to read it, and it was in a way setting the agenda for Earth System Science. I didn't know at that time that it would be powerful and influential, and but actually became so. And the idea is what you see here on the left-hand side, the first Copernican revolution is that, yeah, when people discovered uh, in uh, 14th, 15th, 16th century, that uh, the Earth is actually spinning around the sun and then a completely new perspective on the cosmos and our own reality uh, emerged. And uh, this is still called the Copernican Revolution. And now we are able to look at our own planet from outer space, uh, from satellites, orbits, Apollo astronauts and things like that. That is the second shock, uh, because you see on the one hand how tiny our planet is, on the other hand you can look at the whole picture, and this is sort of in a cartoon style depicted on the lower, on the lower uh, chart here. And uh, when we started to do Earth system analysis, we 
were creating all these spaghetti diagrams. Uh, that's the Bretherton diagram, for example, on the left-hand side. And I tried to encapsulate this in a fundamental equation. The Earth system is uh, a composition of the ecosphere, of course, and the human factor. And the human factor consists of the anthroposphere, that is all the physical, technical machinery, roads, buildings, factories, things like that. And then S is standing for the global subject, an emerging sort of global intelligence. Yeah? And this is happening now, and it's accelerated tremendously by artificial intelligence, of course, and I will refer to that. And uh, so I did a taxonomy of sustainability paradigms. But now we have, you may have read this book by Harari Homo Deus, which is sort of going in that direction. But I mentioned Solaris before, and if you haven't read this novel, you should do it, because it's uh, one of the masterpieces of science fiction based on science. And the idea is that <laughs> on an extraterrestrial planet, there's a very strange ocean, and in the end it turns out that is the fluid global brain of this, uh, of this uh, species. Uh, and it's an intelligent ocean, actually, uh, which is emerging from evolution on that planet. It's quite scary. There's a nice uh, movie on that. And uh, are we going into this mode, uh, planetary intelligence, that's the big question. Anyway, highly recommended to read this masterpiece. Now, and uh, Pontifical Academy, I should say a few words, it's the most exclusive club of scientists in the world. We are just 80 lifetime members appointed by the Pope, but you don't need to be a Catholic. I'm not. <laughs> uh, you don't. We have Jewish people, Hindus, uh, any religion or agnostics. Uh, it's 80 members for lifetime, selected and uh, sort of elected by the members. And uh, 30 of us are Nobel laureates, for example. So you see the quality. Uh, and uh, we had this uh, meeting it's called the Science for Sustainability and Wellbeing in the Anthropocene, Opportunities, Challenges, and Artificial Intelligence. And the symbol you see here is precisely what I will talk about later. It's the combination of high-tech and no-tech. A tree is an evolutionary solution. Uh, nature took 500 million years to optimize the tree. And it's a really optimal structure, of course. Uh, but what if we combine the evolutionary solutions with the most advanced tools of humanity, including general, uh, generalized artificial intelligence? And we talked about it for two, uh, two days, and it was absolutely exciting. And uh, some of the people there in a way, through their thinking, through their doing, through their research, have an impact on Earth observation. So I'll give you a few glimpses. So I chaired one of the sessions, and I'll come to back to that a little bit later. So this is a picture just to uh, introduce you to the scenery. Yeah? And uh, this is the General Assembly in 2016, and you see I'm in the picture in the third row. You cannot see me. But uh, in front of me is sitting Cedric Villani. He's Fields Medal winner in mathematics uh, from uh, a few years ago. And you see on the right-hand side Stephen Hawking, oh, probably the most famous scientist of our time. He sadly uh, died a few years ago, See, he was there. I met him for the first time in 1981 in California. And uh, the Pope comes to the General Assembly, he's extremely interested in science. There was this encyclical Laudato Si, which was very influential on the climate conference in Paris. Uh, and we actually provided uh, the material for that. Uh, 
So this is a unique meeting, uh, and if you just look, the 80 something people in the room represent half of the Nobel laureates and half of the Med Fields Medal and the Blue Planet Prizes uh, we have now. So we had a very exciting meeting, and I give you just a few glimpses. So one of the, the people who talked about uh, was uh, Donna Strickland, Global Environmental Measurement and Monitoring, that is very closely related to the theme of this conference, of course, and I was sitting next to her and we had a nice chat. I just discovered later that she's a physics Nobel laureate. Uh, she was developing in 1987 during her PhD ultra short laser pulses, chirped laser pulses. And when people undergo uh, eye surgery, so called laser surgery, it's based on her work actually, uh, 1987. Uh, and, but you can use it in many other places. Uh, she gave a nice overview of what we can do. This is the usual thing. Geosphere, atmosphere, hydrosphere, biosphere, we have to put it all together. And uh, there is this Optica Association. Wolfgang Wagner should know about it. Where are you, Wolfgang? Yeah, we had a chat before this meeting, uh, and she just talked about uh, the technical development and how we can put together our respective infrastructures based on the most advanced LiDAR and whatever technology, and it's all coming together, really. So this is ocean measurement and monitoring using photonics technologies. Yeah? And I could talk for an hour just about this diagram here. I will not do that, of course. And you are actually more uh, knowledgeable about that than I am. And here we, had, we have a nice <laughs> member recently of the Pontific Academy, that's Demis Hassabis. He's the son of uh, uh, somebody from Cyprus and a lady from Singapore, and his full name would be Demosthenes Hassabis, so a very Greek name, famous Demosthenes. And uh, he's a very smart guy, uh, and he was actually the founder of DeepMind, uh, who developed sort of... Uh, artificial intelligence to play Go and actually beat the world champion of Go. Well, it was you know, in the news, but they have, for example, advanced uh, protein folding sort of simulation, which is advancing the entire field. So I actually invited him to come to Yasa next year, uh, maybe February or March, to give a talk about generalist generalized artificial intelligence. And of course, people have already written books about him, the genius behind the code. Uh, when we meet Demis here, I think, or when you have a chance to meet him, he's a really nice person and he's one of the smartest people on earth right now. And he gave a talk about accelerating scientific discovery of AI. I know that some people are very skeptical you try to publish a paper, you mention machine learning, and when it will be accepted. Wolfgang, we talked about this uh, this morning. So a lot of uh, garbage is being created in the name of artificial intelligence. But believe me, this is the next scientific revolution, a combination of deterministic science. Uh, for example, Demis talked about the various fields this is the famous AlphaGo thing, which beat the very desperate world champion who probably committed suicide afterwards. And I know I'm joking, not really, but I think he was very desperate after losing to AlphaGo. And here is this really fantastic progress on protein folding, uh, where you can... And actually, Three years ago, if we would have had this conference in this room, we all had to wear masks, for example, uh, because of corona and so on. How did we get out of this misery? Well, because of the, the development of vaccines. And these vaccines were created by combinations. You know, it's snippets of messenger RNA, which you inject into the immune system. 
And it's the combination actually of synthetic biology and artificial intelligence because to find the right combination of messenger RNA, you had to test millions and millions of designs. Huh? And only with machine learning you could, could do it within a year or within six months, but generally would have taken a decade or so on. Huh? That's really amazing. So this is the future of even cancer therapy. So people are really convinced that within a decade we will have a generalized vaccination against uh, most types of cancer, really. Yeah? And this would happen anyway, but it would take probably a century without artificial intelligence. With artificial intelligence, it would take a decade only. Yeah? So these are the signs on the wall, so to speak. I talked to several of the people, Eric Lender, for example, is a Nobel laureate in, in medicine and so on, and they are really optimistic for the first time. Huh? And this is alpha fold three. And uh, Demis made a very strong uh, sort of prediction that on weather forecasting based on uh, artificial intelligence, you will easily beat the current Navier-Stokes space, so to speak, approaches. And I, I'm a bit skeptical about it. I think it will be the combination of deterministic modeling based on Earth observation and uh, pattern recognition by machine learning. Yeah? So the combination of deterministic approach and machine learning will do the job and what will mean we will probably tremendously improve uh, for example, weather forecasting and climate modeling. Agent-based modeling clearly is something that will be revolutionized by this. So this is a, a former pet subject of mine, the habitable zone, astrobiology. How many planets do we have in our galaxy where human intelligence, or actually a technical intelligence could develop? And we started, when we started to do this, so we published a few papers on that, on the so-called habitable zone in a planetary system. But at that time, we did not know of any extraterrestrial planet so far. It was the time when we could look at the stars, so the, the sun, so to speak, but no single planet within the galaxy outside our planetary system was discovered and with Hubble and so on and all these advances. Now we know that there are about 20 billion habitable planets in our galaxy, 20 billion. And why shouldn't something like life develop there? Because life developed on this planet very early on, eh? three and a half billion years ago, archaebacteria and so on. So it seems that this is a a standard process. So why don't we hear any signals from outer space? Huh? And you can calculate what is the probability for that. And actually, I did the calculation and I found that, and this is of course out of thin air, uh, didn't even publish this, but the probability is that within our ga galaxy there are at least or there was the development of at least about 100 technical civilizations. So why don't we communicate with them? Well, it has to do with distance and time and so on, but there's a decisive factor. Uh, it's the so-called Drake equation. I think it's even here. So that was a contribution by David Greenspoon, who is the senior scientist for astrobiology of NASA. And he was also referring to the so-called Drake equation, which is calculating the probability that you have a technical civilization within our galaxy, uh, but the probability for interacting with it depends on the lifetime of a technical civilization. So how long will our civilization exist? Because maybe epidemics, it may be nuclear war, it may be climate change and so on. And the current explanation is why we don't communicate with any extraterrestrial intelligences so far is that the overall lifetime 
of a technical civilization is just 500 years. Okay, now you can draw your own conclusions on that. Um, so, very comparative planetology, really interesting. We can look at Venus, we can look at Mars, we can look at Earth, and you see these are the typical patterns of uh, fluid systems, rivers, uh, former rivers, and it's always the same fractal geometry, actually. Yeah? And you can even measure the fractal dimension. And depending on the planetary environment, the fractal dimension is slightly different. So we can compare this already within our solar system, and we will in the future be able to compare it also with extraterrestrial planets. The father of the whole idea of how life co-evolves with the geosphere on a planet is Jim Lovelock and Lynn Margulis, so the famous Gaia hypothesis, and I just wanted. So on the left-hand side, this is actually a paper we published in Nature on the co-evolution of geosphere and biosphere. And, uh, <laughs> and David really came up with this idea Shouldn't we replace the term Anthropocene by the Sapiozoic eon? That means the age where Homo sapiens really behaves in a sapient way, which probably will never happen. So we skip this. <laughs> so let me talk about the real data. Uh, today we are already able to approach a publicly accessible website. This is the Climate Reanalyzer website of the University of Maine. Uh, and you can watch global warming, ocean surface temperature, what have you, every day actually, in the morning. Uh. So that's what I do in the morning. I go to the website and this is, for example, surface temperature of uh, uh, of uh, the annual cycle in January. What you can watch here, for example, is that for 2023 and 2024, it's completely outside the traditional bundle of trajectories. Huh? So it goes back to 1979, and now, if you watch, we have a om almost a quantum leap in the, in the annual temperature profile. Huh? And this is pretty scary when you look to ocean temperatures where you have a real gap now. And now you can go to Climate Reanalyzer and look at, in orange, 2023, and in dark red, 2024. And of course, El Nino is involved in all these things, but they only make a small difference. This is really a new regime, actually, that is emerging. Yeah? Now, it stops on the 26th of September. Why? because Hurricane Helene interfered. So we have a data infrastructure in North Carolina. We had to shut it down because of the hurricane. Eh? So we don't have data for the time being. What you see is that it's actually, in spite of El Nino fading away, the global ocean temperature is coming back and actually crossing even 2023, which is very scary. And we climate analysts don't have any explanation for that. Huh? That is the situation. There seems to be a regime change. It may be just because millions of variables are involved. Shit happens. Huh? It's just a fluctuation. But it may be systemic change already. Huh? And if we stay on that level, this is global mean temperature annually since 1880. And what you see here is yeah, we have this typical CO2 when we have the masking of the CO2 effect by sulfur emissions in the 1960s and 70s. It was the time when people hysterically thought of global cooling, yeah? which was based on a few misguided papers actually only. And since we took away the sulfur mask by putting filters into our... Oh, sort of factories and oil, uh, oil burning uh, power generation facilities and so on. So we have taken away the sulfur mask and now global warming comes full force, so to speak. But if you look at, uh, 
at the curve, it's now bending upwards. This is not a linear trend anymore. So the linear trend would be this green line, uh, but uh, we are super linear now. Is this already a regime shift? And this is what the Paris Agreement tries to avoid, of course. So we had, as an international law, stay well below two degrees. Together with many other people, I provided the ultimate justification why below two degrees, because when we avoid the tipping of uh, subplanetary vital systems, so-called tipping elements in the Earth system, and I could go through that, but this is not really important. What we discover now are the teleconnections between the tipping elements. So you can, for example, find, and by the way, we found it with machine learning. It's published in Nature Climate Change, yeah, 2023. But if you melt down the Greenland ice sheet, when it has a major impact on the thermal land circulation in the North Atlantic, AK Gulf Stream system, this has an impact on the Amazon rainforest, but what we discovered is actually that this has a direct impact on the snow cover of the Tibetan Plateau, which is 15,000 kilometers away. And this again is affecting the Indian summer monsoon. So we are somehow discovering now through all our observation, modeling, and so on, how the Earth system is interconnected. Huh? And it's an extremely fragile, extremely volatile system. So if you intervene in one place, you may find decades later, centuries later, a complete phase transition in a different subsystem. Huh? That is scary, it's very exciting. We are living now in the times where we are discovering things we could not even dream of before, but at the same time we are about to destroy this planet. Huh? So who is going to win the race? Will we become so quickly wiser that we can save this system? Or will we just go down the drain and so we become historians of global change and the destruction of our civilization? So, skip all that. We wrote a paper about this called The Climate Endgame, PNAS 2022. For, for the first time, actually venturing into exploring really not worst case scenarios, bad case scenarios, because the IPCC tries to stay away from that. Uh, because the worst thing people are afraid of as a scientist, if you are called an alarmist. But if you have now a 5, 10, 20% probability that some things will go really wrong, uh, then I think it's our responsibility as scientists to talk about it, to write about it, to explore it. So this is a paper that is uh, even at proposing an entire agenda going into yeah, the dark corner, if you like, of climate scenarios. And so, uh, because I guess I have uh, depressed you a lot now with my talk, uh, and if, if not, when you have fallen asleep in between uh, and I have to wake up again, you should be depressed, actually. I am very depressed about this perspective. But there is some hope, and actually it's coming from completely unexpected corners, actually. So this is the situation. I've shown it many times here within at Yaza, for example. So here what you have is, of course, the timeline 1900 to 2200. Some zeros have been skipped by the technology here. Thanks very much. So uh, we are in the 21st century, believe me. So it's... 1900 to 2200 here. And when you have on the, on the vertical axis global mean temperature change, yeah, you have the Paris lines clearly, 1.5 degrees. As you have seen before, we are beyond 1.5 already. We may duck the line again in the next few years, but more or less 1.5 degrees is gone. Two degrees, can we hold that line? No, we can't. So currently we are here, and this is business as usual. 
and business as usual already includes all the climate policies of the parties to the Paris Agreement. Uh, so we will, by the end of this century, go close to three degrees, and then we could go beyond that, and all these tipping dynamics would be instigated. Uh. So what can we do? Well, the only plan left, because 30 years ago, 40 years ago, we could have actually approach the two degrees line and stabilize the system well. This is not possible anymore. So what we have to do is climate restoration. So we have to weather the storm. We will go into a two degrees plus regime with many dynamics triggered then. We have to survive this and then you have to bend the curve back. And this can only be done with negative emissions. Eh? So it's not only adapting and so on to a warmer climate. No, we have to actively remove CO2 from the atmosphere again. No? And then, of course, if you say this, when all the, all the uh, sort of weird people come forward and say, I have a technology that will extract billions of tons of carbon from the atmosphere, just give me hundred million dollars and I'll do it for you, geoengineering. This is all garbage actually, yeah? because it would be much too expensive and you would have to create a global infrastructure for that. But now I'm coming back to what was the title of our meeting in the Anthropocene. There is a way actually to extract at the right scale carbon from the atmosphere. That is the combination of no tech namely forests, grasses, things like that. So, evolutionary nature-based solutions together with highly advanced technology. And for that, we have to turn to the completely neglected sector in the global economy, the built environment. Because, as you probably know, 40% of the global emissions, 40% of the global emissions um, uh, emanated from building, entertaining, demolishing buildings and infrastructures. Huh? This is the elephant in the sustainability room. We chat and talk and quarrel about air traveling, which is responsible for 3%. We don't talk about the 40% of the built environment, huh? the gray energy, all these things. Huh? And for that, there is a solution and it's called reforesting the planet and retimbering the city. That means try to strengthen the biosphere, whether it's forestry, agriculture, whatever, marine productivity, because we are creating now the conditions on Earth which can make the biosphere thrive. We're always afraid of droughts and so on, and forests will collapse. But actually, we are moving now into a much more uh, productive uh, climate where will be a strengthening of the hydrological cycle. More water will evaporate from the oceans because it's warmer. The warmer climate is helping trees to grow, for example, and we have a much better offering of CO2 in the atmosphere. So in principle, the biosphere could take away lots of the extra CO2. But how would it be done? We have to store this CO2. So if you have a tree and you burn it, instead of using oil or whatever, you are climate neutral. But if you store the photosynthetic CO2, extracted by grasses or trees in long-lasting products, like houses or furniture, then you have created a huge carbon sink. And we have calculated this, it would do the job, let's keep all that. And it would mean that we have to have a new deal with forests and grasses on Earth. This is a highly debated paper by Bastar et al. I think it was published in Science, that we have a potential of one billion hectares of degraded land, which we could reforest in principle in principle, under the new climate conditions with a strengthened hydrological cycle. And of course, we have to have a plan for that. But this is just one step. 
we have to take the next step with biomass, which is harvested through that, has to be converted into infrastructures and so on. And can it be done? Well, the Chinese, whenever there's a problem, an environmental problem, people in Austria, for example, say, oh, we are so tiny, what about the Chinese? Eh? And they have to change their mind. They have changed their mind already. Eh? 50% of all the renewable energy installations are in China, even more actually. And this is uh, how the forest area has increased during the last years. And you see dark green is China. They have reforested the Lus Plateau and so on. But this has to be observed, monitored. There will be talks about Amazonia, of course, I know that. What you see, by the way, is on the northern hemisphere, forest area and forest biomass is increasing through active management, through CO2 fertilization and so on. Where it is decreasing in red is in the southern hemisphere, of course. Yeah? That is the Amazonia, the Congo, Kalimantan, Indonesia and so on. Why? Because of the production of soybeans and things like that. Eh? So this is actually the big challenge. This would be the scheme to save the planet, so I skip that. You don't need to know it. <laughs> and uh, just go to the final thing. Yes, so coming back to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. So we organized a workshop two years ago with Ursula von der Leyen, with world-class architects, to precisely talk about this narrative, reforesting the planet, retimbering the city, using timber instead of concrete and steel and so on. And this is published in this book. And you have your smartphones. If you take a picture now, you can download it for free, Reconstructing the Future, Cities as a Global Common Sink. This is an offer to you. It's for free, actually, because we had a big company paying for the fees. Eh? So because, uh, because is providing this for free. And it's a great paper where we have involved world-class scientists, we have politicians like Ursula von der Leyen who is standing there in the middle, and so on. And I think it's a great thing. So the great 21st century transformation is from dumb, divisive, linear petroeconomy to smart, inclusive, circular bioeconomy. That's the great transformation. The question is, can we accelerate it in a way that uh, we will not be destroyed by climate change and biodiversity loss and so on before? Yeah, and the answer is still open, but you can help to turn it to the positive side. Thanks for listening. <laughs>